gas metal arc welding variables. Here's a list of items that will affect your MIG welds. These items include wire feed speed, voltage, those are two very important ones, weld direction, whether it be a push or pull, travel speed, arc length, shielding gas type, and metal transfer mode. So let's start here at the top and we're going to take a look at the direction in which we weld and that also includes the uh, travel angle work angle uh, that that is a part of that as well so we have here our piece of metal you can see the nozzle from our MIG gun in different angles but they're all moving this way uh, from left to right on this screen so we have a push forehand a perpendicular and then a pull backhand so I'm going to write something down here to keep in mind. Uh, push forehand is great for thin metals such as sheet metal. Okay, so if it's thin, push. So with that being said, obviously our pull or backhand mode is better for plate or just thicker metals in general. Okay. So it you know th three sixteenths is the divider uh, between plate and sheet. Uh, so if you're around there, you can technically run it hot and do a push, or you can run it maybe even a little bit lower and do a backhand and try to make up some of that uh, penetration loss. Either way, it doesn't doesn't matter. Try them both out. Uh, just a little bit of extra penetration on on the pole or backhand. Uh, perpendicular is really just a gun straight up and down. It doesn't matter really if you're going to the right or to the left because it's straight up and down. It doesn't really make a difference. And really what happens here with this pole or backhand is you're shooting the arc back into the hot puddle. Whereas the arc here is kind of going towards the untouched colder metal per se. Okay, so that is uh, the weld direction. Next thing, voltage and uh, wire feed speed. So we have voltage, which we know is uh, electrical pressure, and that's going to control your arc length. So let's go ahead and do a couple examples here. There is a whole video on voltage and wire feed speed I did put together, but let's just say that this is 16 volts, maybe this is 19 volts, and maybe this is like, I don't know, 24 volts. And you can see the distance of the arc on each of these. Okay, you would not be able to see these with the naked eye, but truly that is what's going on. Uh, the higher the voltage, the, the higher chance you're going to have for uh, issues with spatter, but it's also going to spread out your, uh, your bead, so it's going to wet in on the, the sides a little bit better. Uh, so really finding that happy medium is, is where you want to be, and that's for any type of uh, MIG welding that you do. You just got to work it all together, and that includes your wire feed speed as well. So uh, making sure that there's a great relationship between the voltage and the wire feed speed. So with that being said, wire feed speed we uh, measure in inches per minute, IPM inches per minute. And uh, this could range anywhere from, I don't know, maybe 100 inches, maybe even less to 700 inches. Maybe machines even go beyond 700. Uh, but there's a huge range of uh, the speed for uh, different wire feeders or the combo machines where it's the power source and the wire feeder all in one. Uh, we use a lot of those in our shop. Uh, but anyways, we have wire feed speed inches per minute controls your amperage. Remember, as wire feed speed goes up, your amperage goes up with it. You're, you're putting down more metal, so you have to have the heat there to go ahead and melt that metal. Okay, so with that being said, uh, if we have different wire feed speeds here, we're going to see more penetration with the higher numbers because we know that amperage goes up with that as well. Uh, this is a great time to uh, mention that with a constant voltage machine, you can also increase your amperage by getting closer to the metal. Okay, so why is that? Well, it's constant voltage, so the voltage, whatever you set it at, let's say you go to 19 volts, and you get a little bit closer, and maybe that voltage actually drops a little bit just because you're closer. It doesn't need the pressure there to maintain the arc. And any time we talk about 
uh, power, if voltage goes up, amperage goes down, and if uh, voltage goes down, amperage goes up. So we get a little bit closer to the metal with our gun. The voltage will drop just a little bit, but you'd be surprised when you look at a constant voltage uh, uh, graph, you know, you, you look at the graphs that they have in the textbooks, uh, the, the voltage will only change a little bit, and that's because it's really changing, you know, by the, the tenths of a volt. And maybe it'll be a full volt, and that's actually quite a bit in welding. You'd be surprised. You go from 18 to 19, there are some differences that are occurring, but your amperage will actually spike or drop if you get close and farther away. But again, a little bit closer would spike your amperage, a little bit farther would jack up your voltage and actually drop your amperage, okay? Here's just a picture I put together of the, I guess the nozzle, the wire coming through the contact tip or contact tube, whatever you want to call that. You can see we got some shielding gas flowing. Uh, we got our base metal there. We got a little bit of a, an arc length going on, okay? And then we got our puddle down here. So a couple things I want to mention because we do say these in our classes. We talk about stick out, electrode extension, and then CTWD, contact tip to work distance. Okay, so the three of them do differ. So we have electrode extension. That is how far the electrode sticks from the contact tip to the arc. Okay, so from here to the arc is electrode extension. From here all the way down to the base metal is your contact tip to work distance. So I'm just going to throw a random short circuit setting out there. Maybe we're around like 18 volts and let's say 200 inches per minute. I would say the distance between and the base metal, I don't know, maybe 3 eighths to, I don't know, up to about a half inch off the base metal. Okay, so it's not a huge gap. There's there's not a whole lot of room there, but it's also not too close where you can't really see the wire. You want to be able to see the wire so you can see the arc, the puddle, and everything else going on there. Okay, uh, to continue, we have a stick out, and that stick out is how much that wire sticks out beyond the actual nozzle. So if you use a pair of whelpers, which are weld helpers, pliers uh, if you they have a little wire cutting uh, side to them if you have that side farther away and then you flush the pliers up to the nozzle then it'll cut it like the perfect stick out it all right shielding gas we have two types of shielding gas really that are out there and we can blend these as well so we have what you'll hear is inert gas and then active or reactive gases okay so Inert are your noble gases that you'd find over here in the uh, periodic table of elements. And when we talk about welding, we deal with helium and argon. Even though there are other noble gases, we deal with helium and argon. And I will say argon by far is more common in welding, whether it be MIG, flux core, TIG, doesn't matter. It's more common. It's also a lot cheaper. Uh, active, reactive gases are gases used in welding for a specific purpose, but can react with other elements, whereas these noble gases, they're not going to react with anything because they're noble. Uh, really, their outer shell of their atom is full, so they can't take on electrons and they can't give them away either. So it's perfect. Well, two gases that we use um, that are active or reactive, and we mix them in with our argon or helium possibly, is carbon dioxide, CO2, and oxygen. So the common shielding gases include 100% argon, uh, inert gas that we use for aluminum, magnesium, nickel alloys, titanium, and silicon bronze welding. Okay, uh, we don't use 100% argon for steel alone. You know, there's always a mix. All right, argon itself reduces spatter. It also doesn't allow us to have as much penetration. Actually, what it does is you get a penetration that kind of looks like a finger uh, when we're welding on a piece of metal. So it gets thin in the middle here, okay? CO2 is an active gas that we use on steel. CO2 behaves as an inert gas, but this gas is used on steel 
produces deep penetration, lots of spatter. Uh, we use it possibly for globular transfer. Not sure that we're going to try to save money and, uh, and, and use CO2 for any other reason than the penetration because it's, it's sloppy. So we get a lot of spatter, which is going to cause for post-weld cleanup. And we're using globular, okay? So it's just sloppy. Not good for sheet metal, uh, but again, it is an inexpensive gas, okay? So let's go to 7525, probably the number one gas out there for MIG. Short circuit transfer, some spatter, but if it's bad, you got some setting issues that are going on, okay? So it's not the gas, it's your settings. Great for thin metals and also open roof passes. So... We use it on stuff. We'll, we'll still use it on like quarter inch or maybe even three eighths, and that's not a problem. We'll use it on half inch and stack beads, and that's fine. Remember, not everything has to be 100% penetration, you know, through and through. It, that's not necessary. You know, we're trying to hold metal together, and you'd be surprised how strong this stuff is. But then in like our qualification classes when we're certifying our welders, uh, we use it on our open root pass. So maybe there's a little bit of an open root with a... Uh, what we call uh, root face and it's thin enough where we can blast through there and then get our 100% penetration because that in that case we're looking for it okay so keep in mind 7525 very very common but it is only for short circuit possibly some globular welding okay 9010 is a mix of 90 argon 10% co2 and this is a great gas for spray and also pulse spray transfer Spray is a super hot welding process. You can just fill up weld joints super quick using larger wires. It's it's actually a, a great uh, metal transfer mode for a MIG. Um, almost no spatter other than usually at the start because the wire hits and creates a really just a big explosion. But then after that, it, it sprays. It's quiet. Not a whole lot going on. I got a whole video on the uh, transfer modes um, as well. Okay, and that just leaves with this. So we got short circuit globular spray, pulse spray. So we do have some different options. Uh, keep in mind, uh, this is the coldest. This is the hottest. And these two can kind of go together, okay? This is sloppy here. You know, you're going to get lots of spatter. Uh, people don't usually purposely go into globular, uh, although they can. You know, we see a lot of short circuit. It's all position welding. Um, you can make some really nice beads, you know, stacking dimes. Uh, and then you have spray, which it just sprays it in like butter, literally, like the like it says, it sprays it in there, um, but it's hotter. We're limited to our positions. And really, our pulse spray allows us to do the exact same thing except for multi-positions like our short circuit. So it's kind of the, uh, the ultimate uh, welding process for MIG or metal transfer mode for MIG. The problem is, does your machine have a pulse mode? Um, and if not, you know, it's probably going to cost you a little bit more to get one of the machines that actually has that as an option. Uh, awesome. If you get a chance to use it, you can spray metal literally vertical overhead and uh, anything else that you can imagine. And that wraps up a handful of variables to consider while MIG welding. In review, wire feed speed, voltage, weld direction, push-pull perpendicular, travel speed, arc length, shielding gases, and different metal transfer modes.